these words, the White Rose spoke out against the Third Reich. Their passionate protests, set within the backdrop of Nazi Germany during World War II, sparked a fiery response and harsh consequences. Although their revolutionary measures were cut short by the Nazis, they left a lasting impact. They tried to reform a broken Germany and foment a revolution that would topple Hitler's regime. The need for reform stemmed from Adolf Hitler's rise to power in 1933. Germany was in shambles after World War I. Hitler used the resulting economic ruin to transform his country from a democracy to a harsh dictatorship, while also becoming an international superpower. The depravity and oppression of the Third Reich called for a revolution, yet no one responded. Onto the stage of history stepped a group of college students at the University of Munich called the White Rose. All of the students came from average, middle-class backgrounds. Hans and Sophie Scholl, part of the White Rose's inner circle, had become disillusioned with the conformity of the Hitler Youth. As a Russian, Alexander Schmorell was instilled from an early age with a feeling of deep resentment towards racial epithets propagated by the Germans against Russia. Willy Graf's father was an upstanding Nazi, but as a devout Catholic, Graf couldn't accept Hitler's methods. Christoph Probst was eager to get involved in any effort to bring the Third Reich down. And finally, medical student Traute Le France could not accept the brutality of Hitler's regime. These people were more than just the leaders of the White Rose. They were best friends. The original intent of their weekly meetings wasn't to resist, but to discuss literature, art, and high culture. However, the meetings morphed over time to conversations about the Third Reich, censorship, unfairness, and outrage. So it was more kind of a moral indignation, I would say. I think it came out as more and more indignation, the screaming, this came go on, you know, where we're going. We are so, so far away from what's right and what should be right and what's moral in the deepest sense. The members were heavily influenced and inspired by a Catholic bishop named Clemens von Galen who uncovered the Nazi regime's euthanasia programs and publicly condemned them in his sermons. It was von Galen's bravery and clear-sightedness that convinced many of the members of the White Rose that reform was not only possible, but necessary. Hans Scholl and Alexander Schmorell were the first to funnel their outrage into a concrete reaction. They drafted a set of leaflets, eloquent ideological forays into revolution, not so much a call to arms as philosophical treaties against Hitler. Who among us has any conception of the dimensions of shame that will befall us and our children when one day the veil has fallen from our eyes in the most horrible of crimes, crimes that infinitely outdistance every human measure, reach the light of day? They distributed their revolutionary words throughout Munich, each ending with a request to copy the leaflet and pass it on. The group's leaflets called for active resistance against Hitler. They thought if they could reach the Academia of Germany, the seeds of a revolution would be planted. Leaflets calling for resistance to the regime had been scattered, and the city had been shaken as if by an earthquake. Everything was still standing, life went on as before, but beneath the surface something had changed. The despotic nature of the Nazis made Scholl and Schmerl's leaflets even more remarkable. The Third Reich consisted of a climate of conformity and fear. Dissent was out of the question, because dissent meant death. Soon, Scholl and Schmerl's other friends joined in on the effort. In February of 1943, the White Rose convinced their favorite professor, a staunch anti-Nazi named Kurt Huber, to attend some of their meetings. He agreed with the White Rose's revolutionary goals and penned the sixth leaflet. Perhaps the most powerful of all, it was an emotional reaction to the staggering loss at Stalingrad. It called for the German people to fight for freedom and break free of the party's grasp. The students penned their controversial beliefs regardless of the consequences. Of all the resistance measures going on in Germany throughout World War II, the White Rose is one of few to have mentioned treatment of Jews in their work. Since the conquest of Poland, 300,000 Jews have been murdered in this country in the most bestial way. Here we see the most frightful crimes against human dignity, a crime that is unparalleled in the whole of history. In plain and simple terms, they addressed what no one else was willing to face, the Holocaust. February 18th was the beginning of the end for the White Rose. The Scholls were caught spreading Huber's leaflet throughout campus. Probst and the Scholls were the first of many to stand trial by the People's Court. They were found guilty of high treason and executed on the same day. Two months later, Schmorell, Huber, and Graf were tried and executed. 
Ultimately, over 80 people were tried for crimes connected to the White Rose. With so much eloquence and bravery in one group, why did the White Rose fail at their revolutionary goals? Their reaction was undeniable. They recognized Hitler's evil and had a burning desire to fix a broken Germany. Now that we have recognized the Nazis for what they are, it must be the sole and first duty, the holiest duty of every German, to destroy these beasts. The members called for more than just a removal of the existing government. They wanted to reshape the entire framework of Germany. They were calling for an upheaval of German social and political ideas, a 180 degree turnaround. The White Rose was demanding a revolution. You know, in that sense, the White Rose was revolutionary. They didn't really have a chance to articulate a mission. And I think what they were calling for was a revolutionary change. They were calling for something that involved a much more thorough reshaping of German society and the way Germany was behaving. However, their revolutionary demands were never fully realized due to a lack of popular support, organization, and enforcement. As Hitler described in his book, Mein Kampf, All great movements are popular movements. A successful revolution depends upon the support of the masses. Nazi Germany saw the White Rose as traitors, a band of rebel college students who hated their country and deserved to be executed. In most cities, a majority of the leaflets were handed over to the Gestapo. At that time, People were not ready for a revolution. However, the general public not only read what the White Rose wrote, but were also tremendously moved by the group's writings. Diaries from that time mentioned the White Rose leaflets. The average German was impacted by their words. This attention made the Nazis fear what the White Rose represented. The reason they acted as harshly as they did is they were afraid that if they didn't nip it in the bud, that other people would also rise up and, and listen to their words. Yet the White Rose never had a chance to act upon their beliefs. The members were executed before anyone could start an actual rebellion. The leaflets written fulfill the moral and ideological aspects of a revolution with the students' ambitious dreams of reforming Germany, but lacked the necessary drive to successfully accomplish the revolution they desired. Although they failed to accomplish their goals, the White Rose succeeded in reforming their country. Even after their executions, other dissenters followed in their example. Their words continued to reverberate throughout Germany. A group of high school students in Ulm took up the cause and copied the original leaflets when they heard of the executions of the White Rose members. The Allies dropped thousands of copies of the sixth leaflet all over German territory as anti-Nazi propaganda. However, the true legacy of the White Rose wasn't felt until after Germany had gained perspective on the war. They found in the White Rose not a band of traitors, but a group of heroes. Schmerl was made a saint by the Russian Orthodox Church. In a 2003 survey, the German public chose the Scholes amongst the most influential and important Germans in history, ranked above masters such as Beethoven and Einstein. Long term, they were effective because once people start talking about their words, they have changed Germany. They've really made a difference in the long term picture. They stand as a kind of a symbol of a remarkable, selfless act of conscience in a horribly brutal atmosphere. They were passive but passionate, ideological but articulate, and although their goals never came to fruition, their influence lives on to this day. By their terms, the White Rose failed, but to Germany, their reforms are a source of hope for future generations. <laughs>